this is the next in a series of departmental seminars by associate professors across the different divisions. And before we introduce Stuart, um, Scott uh, brought us an idea that before we introduce that we allow one of the senior admin team to stand up and tell us why it's important to what they're doing and get to know them and get some messages across. So today, Vicky has drawn the short straw and she's going to tell us what she does all day. Yeah. What I do all day. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're going to introduce our team, the academic administration team, talk about where we are based, what we do, and I need to talk a quick word about email, so I'll try and remember all those things. So the academic administration team is made up of myself, my colleague Eve, who's in the corner over there, and Jan Daniels, who's our dean, she's on the screen for me. Um, and we essentially uh, cover two main areas. So the undergraduate side of things is our year five, clinical neurosciences, ophthalmology, and ENT course. Okay, so it's an eight week rotation. Anybody who is here early in the morning, so half eight, I hate to say earlier, we're here earlier, um, nine o'clock ish, every two weeks, every eight weeks, you may have noticed the number of students, more students, young 20 something girl around. You may have been ushered into room B if you think you look about CBK, you may have maybe I've recognised I'm in the group. Um, you may see us hovering by the door if you look like a lecturer that we're waiting for because they're running late and a bit anxious. Um, so you may have seen a mannequin turning up. We have uh, four group sessions where office staff bring up one of their mannequins so they come into room B. Uh, we have small group sessions where we have students with the bed to step on there. We have yoga mats around. So if any of you've been up there, up around here and seen that, that's what's going on. This is our year five teaching. And Eve very ably runs that for us, which is a very sweet thing. She's very efficient. Uh, the other side of it, which maybe more of you will know me from, is the Dean Phil side of it. I recognize one of our students. Um, and we look after things like the application process. If, you, if you've been here from 1780, then I would have been part of that. Uh, before that, we had interesting volunteer interviews. But we do all the interviews for the Dean Team and everything that relates to that. Um, so you'll get emails from us with some of your milestones we've started all the way. Um, it's it's nice for us to have the Dean side of things because we get to know you. The year five students are always very weak, so they change very quickly. The Dean Phil students are always for longer. Three years of it is quite nice because one of them sort of wants to get rid of you if I was four. Um, but um, yeah, it's a really, really good side of it and fantastic for us to be up here on level six. We were based down on level three with the rest of the admin team. We moved up here in July, June, and we are opposite room D. Um, it's been really helpful for us to be here, not only for the year five side of things, because most of the teaching is up here. But for, for the deeper as well, to see these students, see good PI supervisors, be a little bit more in touch with you is uh, really, really good, well, certainly for me. And then just to bring it all together, um, we do, it's not just the teaching for the year five, it's not just the digital side of it. We run an away day for our teaching staff, our faculty staff, because it's very important um, that we build that loyalty into the program that um, faculty feel supported in what they're doing. Uh, we had a very successful away day at Sam's College back in February. We also, another dimension to this, we run what's called an expert patient tutor program where we have uh, patients with MS, peripheral neuropathy, Parkinson's, who we bring in, uh, we meet our year five students, we get a chance to talk to them about their signs, get their hands on them, examine, you know, what it's like, <coughs> our cogwheels, all those sorts of things. Um, it's a really beneficial thing for both the patients and the students. And one thing that highlighted me recently is last week we had an event with Novartis <coughs> and the Big Data Institute, where they did a piece of research on MS. They came here last week. We had a day and a half where they met our lecturers and they had some, they had the Gator's Gator seminar. Palace through about MS, 
just to give these people who are working on data for MS an idea about the disease and an understanding of it because they didn't really realize what they were dealing with. And then the highlight on the Friday was that they met three of our MS patients. And I facilitated one of those groups. And at the end of that, <coughs> one of the statisticians said, this is going to completely change how we do our research. We never realized there was different. We thought there was just one symptom from MS, and that's how we need to be treated. We didn't realize there were berries. We didn't realize how soon it started, how there were certain signs years before they were actually diagnosed with MS. So very exciting, very positive, <coughs> and very satisfying. Um, the education committee just wanted to mention that is how we bring all six of these things together. So thinking about teaching, thinking about courses that we're doing, giving CPD to certain courses is something that we're doing at the moment. Um, honorary senior clinical lecture titles, that if you suppose if you've got one of those, we're looking into that. You're a third from us uh, last year, we'll be doing something again about how we're making sure that everyone is, is on the same page with those. And I can't read my notes anymore. A lot going on, it's a good program. Um, us three are very keen to help and be involved in, in everything. Emails, very quickly, teaching emails, everyone knows about, and the teachers will get, most of us get copies through that, which is also shared with Nikki Andrew. Nikki, Vicky, sometimes that gets confused because Nikki feels that this one round, but there's a blonde ish in the uh, work in the same office. Uh, we, share the, so we share the same email address. Uh, but everything tends to go there. Anything graduate, I would appreciate going to the graduates at NBCN. Uh, you know, just, just help to separate the email address. I think it's possible. I need to use Okay. Well, no, Kevin's going to use it. Sorry. Okay, so a um, very brief introduction, Stuart, who um, everyone knows really has been around for a long time. And the work of Russell Foster's group has taught us that, you know, all this light coming in through our eyes and sort of bounce off the retina and go out again and do nothing. It transforms us biologically. And Stuart's one of the people at the forefront of really helping us understand how both the brain and, and these other systems are affected by light. And he's going to tell us all about it. Stuart. Okay. Right, well, thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, right, and well, thank you for the opportunity to give this sort of presentation. And many people, I apologize in advance, many people will probably know what we do or have some idea of what we do. And I also apologize to the people who get the aversive response that I'm normally up here to give sort of overviews related to laboratory animal use on our term meeting. So I'm actually going to talk about what we do in the lab now and talk about some science. So first of all, my title is actually, a, um, it's indirectly it's stolen from the title of a popular science book about behavioral genetics which is all about the work of Seymour Benzer. And for those of you who don't know Seymour Benzer, he was actually the guy who did a lot of the first work actually identifying the role of genes in regulating behavior. And this was all done in the fruit fly. And actually his work was the basis for actually the, the work um, that actually won the Nobel Prize for circadian rhythms a couple of years ago. Um, he was no longer alive, but he should have been the person who got it. So. So what I'm going to be talking about today is, first of all, a little bit of background. Some work we did a few years ago related to jet lag. Some work that's actually unpublished at the moment, but is actually uh, is in preparation about um, sleep genetics. And this is actually using forward genetics in the same way that Benzer did to identify, uh, to identify genes involved in sleep. Um, some work that we've been doing for over a number of years on um, sleep and arousal. And then finish off on some work on um, how light does affect <coughs> learning and memory. And this is all primarily in animal models. And so effectively, what, um, it's a bit of a snapshot of some of the different things that we do in the lab. So first of all, background, of course, you're all aware that life on Earth has evolved into a 24-hour cycle of life in the dark. And as a result, virtually all organisms possess an internal biological or circadian clock. And this actually means that not just, just because it gets light in the morning we wake up and it gets dark in the night we go to sleep. If we're kept in constant conditions, or if you keep any organism in constant conditions, they still operate on a 24 hour cycle. And that is because this internal rhythm, this circadian rhythm, is actually internally generated. It's actually a, an internal biological clock. And it, it, this has been shown to provide a selective advantage, and it actually by allowing organisms to anticipate changes in their environment rather than simply just responding to the fact that it gets light in the morning, dark in the night. And so the sorts of processes it regulates this is based upon human data, but it regulates things like hormone profiles, so we're all familiar with. Melatonin levels are low during the day, high in the night. 
cortisol levels in humans are higher during the day, lower at night. Even things like body temperature, the raw tools is standard, actually shows a circadian rhythm and can vary by as much as a degree over the 24 hour cycle. Um, things like cognitive performance, um, lapses in attention, memory recall, all of these things have been shown in humans who operate over a 24 hour cycle as well. And so the point of all of this is that it actually optimizes physiology and behavior to the demands of the 24 hour <coughs> cycle and to the, the, um, the demands of activity and rest. There's no point having, you know, a brilliant ability to concentrate and recall you know, memories when you're typically asleep. Um, and similarly, um, there's no point actually you know, um, you know, not being able to sleep when it's dark, and that's the ideal time to be sleeping. So in terms of how this sort of circadian system is organized, well, primarily light in mammals, light is detected by the eye and is conveyed by the retinal hypothalamic tract to a small paired nuclei in the, the um, in the anterior hypothalamus, suprachiasmatic nuclei, <coughs> and this is thought to be effectively a master circadian pacemaker that controls the pain rhythm throughout the body. Um, and this is what the actual SEM looks like, paired nuclei, just above the optic chiasm, as the name suggests. And actually by a neural, hormonal, and behavioral signals, the SCN regulates clocks that are actually found in, in tissues and organs throughout the body. So things like the heart, kidney, um, and liver all contain circadian clocks, but actually they need to be kept in the appropriate phase by the SCN. And so if you look at an animal like a mouse, this is measured using wheel running activity. On a night, as a nocturnal species, the animal is active, running in the wheel, allowing us to record its activity. Um, and this is a draw light dark cycle. But if you place the animal in constant dark, they still show these around 24 hour cycles. Um, and in mice, it's not exactly 24 hours, it's slightly short, about 23 and a half. So every day they advance about by about half an hour. This is what's termed free running activity. The same effect happens is if you lose the eye, actually organisms become free running and can no longer respond to the light environment. If the SCN is damaged, such as a lesioning study, under constant conditions, animals are just active at random. And so actually there is no internal um, coordination of activity anymore. And so how are these rhythms generated? Well, actually, the core mechanism, as I say, this is the work that actually the Nobel Prize was awarded for, which was originally done in Drosophila, but was then actually translated into mammals. Basically, you have two, um, two transcriptional coactivators, BMAL1 and CLOP. They bind to E boxes in the enhancer regions, which are enhancer regions in certain key CLOP genes. And particularly, they drive the expression of PER1 and 2, CRY1 and 2, which are key, uh, uh, key CLOP genes. Uh, translated into protein, these bond homo and heterodimers, and feedback in this, in, and inhibit the activity of BMAL and CLOP. So actually you have an autoregulatory um, feedback loop whereby genes actually regulate their own expression. And this happens over a 24 hour period. This is what's called the transcriptional translational feedback loop. Now that's the basic mechanism. That's currently, well this is a few years out of date, but it is slightly more complicated than that. There's a whole host of other genes involved and proteins as well. And another key thing to note from this is that these e-box also, e boxes also drive the expression of clock control genes. And these genes are actually typically the, the effectors that regulate the, the tissue-specific physiology. So that actually you have cassettes of genes that are important to cardiac function, that are regulated by the circadian clock in the heart, clocks, uh, genes associated with liver function and metabolism in the liver, and it enables different tissues to regulate different processes with a 24-hour rhythm. But of course, a clock is no use unless you can set it to the correct time. And in mammals, as I mentioned already, light is the primary time for you. Um, and as such, light is detected in mammals by the eye. You may hear things every so often in the late 90s, there was a great story that all the press picked up on about light behind the knee setting circadian rhythms. The press didn't pick up on the study that then came out in Science straight afterwards, which then said, actually, this is completely compounded by other things that they did. So that doesn't make good news real. So, so effectively, light, the eye is the primary organ for detecting light in the circadian system. And therefore the eye performs two very different functions. It has a visual function enabling us to map the world around us and so we know where objects are spatially in our environment. But it also performs this non-visual function whereby we can just detect the brightness of our environment. Now this is actually how we were thinking about it for quite a number of years, that we have these visual and non-visual functions. Realistically, it's probably not quite that, day, quite that simple, and it's probably more of a continuum. If you can detect that it's brighter in that part of your environment than that part of your environment, is that visual or non-visual? It has a spatial component. It doesn't allow you to see very detailed things, 
but effectively it's probably more of a continuum whereby you go from blindness all the way through to actually an image and you go from you know, environmental blindness at this end all the way up to actually <coughs> or spatial vision at the other end. But even restoring some element of um, crude vision can be enough to actually, of course, to navigate in this environment. So what are the photoreceptors? And of course, you know, the retina contains primarily two types of photoreceptors, the rods and the cones. Rods basically operate at the very low light levels, whereas cones operate at the brighter light and actually in the human retina consists of the red, green and blue cones which give us our colour vision. And so, of course, the work that Russell did, this was going back to the, the, um, the 90s, was to look at mice with retinal degeneration. And so, of course, you get rid of the rods and cones. We use uh, a naturally occurring RG1 mutation from mice with a cone transgene, with a diphtheria-driven transgene to lesion the cones as well. And, and remarkably, these animals still respond to light. They still can train the circadian system perfectly well, even though they actually have no visual responses. And of course, the photoreceptors involved are these cells. So the, so the subset of retinal ganglion cells that express this um, interesting light sensitive protein called melanopsin. Um, and these become photosensitive retinal ganglion cells or intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And these account for about 1 to 3% of the retinal ganglion cells. This is what these cells actually look like. This is an image from Steve Hughes in our lab, um, actually showing the network of these cells in the mouse retina. And these cells, this is melanopsin expression in green. And you actually can see they form this net across the retina. These cells detect environmental brightness and actually they're most sensitive to 480 nanometers, which differs from the rod and cone pigment. So effectively it's in the sort of blue part, blue region of the spectrum. So that's where I'm tracking the So the non-image forming or non-visual functions that we're talking about include things like setting the circadian clock, circadian entrainment. It also involves things like pupil constriction. Mice without rods and cones can still drive full pupil constriction. You need slightly more light, but actually you can still attain pupil, full pupil constriction, and that is actually driven by the melanopsin system as well. Pineal melatonin production, and a whole range of other aspects of physiology and behavior, including things like alertness, sleep, and so on, and I'll come to that in a moment. <coughs> and of course, our modern environment therefore poses a whole range of different challenges to the circadian system. That includes things like light pollution, we keep filling our um, environment with light, um, including on a night when it should be dark, things like shift work, where we're operating when our bodies are telling us that we should be asleep. Um, of course, the ubiquitously covered by the media, the aspects of light emitting devices, but also things like building design, and actually the, build, you know, the architectural community getting very interested in these photoreceptors, where they're interested in build, you know, creating new buildings, which actually also take these non-visual effects of light into account as well. Um, they're not necessarily interested in the detailed biology, which leads them to sometimes build buildings which are completely pointless. <laughs> but the point of it is that we need to understand how <coughs> the mechanisms by which light regulates our physiology and behavior if we're going to really optimize our life environment. So moving on from that, I just want to then move on to, to jet lag. So as I mentioned before, light is signaled from the eye to the SCM by the retina hypothalamic tract. Um, and so how could light, we've got this molecular clock in the SCM, this transcriptional translational feedback loop, we've got a novel photoreceptor, but how do the two actually interact? So the basic mechanism, going back a few for about 10 years, was that we have release of the glu uh, neurotransmitter glutamate from PACAP at the RHT SCM synapse. That leads to um, activation, phosphorylation of uh, well, various signaling pathways which effectively converge upon cyclic AMP response element binding protein. It leads to phosphorylation of CREB, that binds to CRE elements, and you can get these CRE elements, particularly the, the promoters of PER1 and PER2. That upregulates the expression of PER1 in response to light, and that therefore leads to, it actually leads to this shift in response to light. So if you have a free running animal, an animal free running, exposed to light, it will delay its clock the next day. So it starts its activity later the next day, and that is actually then you know, is associated with this upregulation of PER1 and PER2 in response to light. So effectively setting the molecular hands of the clock. <coughs> but the effects of light are actually limited, and this goes back to again some older data whereby if you look at the phase shift, the magnitude, how much an animal will delay its clock in response to light, if you increase the light intensity, you produce basically like a drug, so it conforms to with a dose of light, you get completely responsive to a plateau. But also, if you actually give continuous light and look at the levels of per one, they go up, but even though the light is still on, they don't stay up, they actually come back down again. And this decrease here led us to actually start suggesting, well, is there some sort of negative feedback on this light input pathway as well? Well, why is that important? 
Well, it actually relates to the fact that why, you know, why is it so difficult to adjust to a new time zone? <laughs> Effectively, um, when you travel across multiple time zones, you need about an hour for every time zone to, to, to an hour, uh, sorry, a day to adjust for every hour you, tra you transition across time zones. So if you have a six hour transition across time zones, you would need around five to six days for your body, for your circadian clock to actually catch up with the new time zone. And so there's a limit on how quickly your biological clock can shift. But what's the actual mechanism? Why, what is this negative feedback? So why does it take so long to adjust to the new time zone? <coughs> so the way that we started looking at this several years ago now is actually we just was using ACI uh, gene chips and we actually looked at light regulated genes in the mouse SCS. So this was a you know, collected mice across a time course, exposed to light, collected the superchiasmatic nucleus, which is about you know, half a millimeter in diameter, and then we ran a whole series of microarrays to look for the light regulated genes. And amongst the, sort of the genes that run regulated in response to light, we couldn't decipher like one of the gene, other genes that, uh, that we expected to be upregulated, but it was another gene called PIC1. And so this was potentially of interest. It's a gene called salt induced salt inducible kinase 1. So what does SIC1 do? And this is really work that um, RP Jackanak was also involved with, which was working as a postdoc with in our lab. Um, and so actually RT then sets about using fibroblasts of the cellular clock model to study the actual detailed mechanisms of this. Um, and so you can actually, as I mentioned earlier, we have this molecular clock in virtually all cells and tissues in the body. So you can actually use fibroblasts as a cellular model and these cells actually still have a molecular clock. Um, and instead, they're not responsive to light, but if you actually change the serum, in the, do a serum shock, you can actually get phase shifting responses, and this seems to involve the same molecular sort of clock mechanism. And so Artie looked at this in more detail, and, and effectively, the mechanism by which we thought SIP1 may be acting is it's upregulated in response to light, but actually, also, you have this phosphorylated CREB on the, that acts on the cyclic AP response elements, upregulating FER1 and SIP1, but actually there's also a coactivator called CRTC. And CRTC is actually a, is a target of SIC1. So SIC1 is upregulated to protein produce, protein feeds back and deactivates CRTC, which removes this coactivation. So actually will then switch off its own, potentially switch off its own mechanism. So through a series of different studies we did in vitro, we showed that actually in response to actually a phase shifting serum shock, that you've got CRTC moving to the nucleus from the cytoplasm, that there's an upregulation of SIC1 and PER1 in response to the serum shock, <coughs> that there's phosphorylation of CRTC, which depended upon uh, SIC1, and that actually if you use siRNA to block SIC1, you actually got an increased um, upregulation of PER1 in response to the serum shock. Well, that's all very nice in terms of looking at a cellular model, but what about actually in vivo? What, you know, what's really happening? So what then she went on to do was to really look at this and actually look at animals under a light dark cycle um, and rather than sending them halfway around the world, we can just keep them in a chamber and shift the light dark cycle six hours. And then we can actually then count how many days it takes them to actually to re-entrain this new light dark cycle. And when you do that, um, and this is the actual data with the SIC1, with a, this was blocking the action of SIC1 using um, siRNA, and the, the non-targeting siRNA, the animal took several days to re-entrain. Um, so this, for the sick one, these animals were adjusting almost in, uh, within a day or two. And so this actually shows the pervasive day, so showing that if you block the action of sick one animals within what, two or three days, it will actually re-entrain new light dark cycle. So effectively, what we think is happening is that we have light inputs to the SCN, and this is actually used for calcium influx activation of things, we have several, um, intracellular and um, signaling met happily the increases that protein time of day, but you get this coactivation of CRTC. You get phosphorylation of CREB, coactivation by CRTC, and that is what then drives the activity of the cyclic AMP response elements. That upregulates the PER1, changing the phase of the molecular clock. But then what happens is the SIC1 is produced, that feeds back and actually switches off the action of CRTC, removing this coactivation. So this negative feedback is actually what is limiting the effects of light on the molecular clock. And so it provides a new target for trying to, rather than trying to actually shift the clock just with a pharmacological agent, you could actually have a, an agent, you could potentially use an agent which would enhance the effect of light on the clock. So actually it would mean that light would become more efficacious at actually shifting the biological clock. So effectively the way we've been thinking about this is there's a natural break that stops your clock being able to shift. And just like with a car, there are two ways to make a car go faster. One is to put your foot on the accelerator, the other is to take the handbrake off. 
Um, and it just means that actually you can take the brake off and actually shift more quickly. And so that's a very pain on that. So, so moving on then, uh, on to then um, the, another, another element of what we've been doing more recently is related to sleep genetics. Now, as you're probably all aware, sleep is a complex polygenic, polygenic behavior. It involves a whole range of different neurotransmitters and, uh, and um, various structures. Um, and it's, you know, studies have shown that numerous genes contribute to the regulation of sleep, but actually we don't actually have a very good understanding of the, of the genetic basis of, the, um, of sleep and some of the mechanisms really regulating it at the genetic level. And the absence of activity is not the same as sleep. So, um, and of course, <coughs> sleep is not just a simple circadian output. It's actually regulated by primarily by two processes. One is a homeostatic process, another is a circadian process. The homeostatic process is basically a complicated way of saying the longer you've been awake, the more you will need to sleep. And so actually, as you increase in the week from the morning throughout the day, your, your homeostatic drive for sleep increases, um, and then later on in the day when you sleep, that tube will then decline. But actually you also have this circadian regulation of sleep as well. So when your, your homeostatic drive is high, you actually have your circadian clock counteracts that to try to keep you awake, um, even, um, even though you may actually have a high sleep day. And a, a result of that is, of course, most people will have experienced is if you go try to go to bed a few hours early on a night, you will lie there wide awake because actually your circadian system is keeping you awake, even if you are tired. So, um, and of course, one of the things we've had is actually we've also shown that acute light exposure also regulates sleep. So if you expose a mouse to an acute um, light pulse in, in its night, the animal will quickly goes to sleep. Uh, and sleep is classically measured, of course, using EEG and EMG recording. Um, and that could be in animals, this could be using telemetry or by tethered recording. So, but the problem with this is that they're invasive and not too, very suitable for high throughput phenotyping. Uh, the data are complicated, and I think we have some people from Vlad's lab in the audience who would, test, uh, would probably testify to the fact that you know, the data analysis is complicated, it involves a lot of hard work to actually then really um, to go through all of that, uh, these large data sets. So we started a few years ago to try to think, can we actually do a lot of the time, we want to do just a quick sleep screen before we go into then do more detailed sleep phenotyping. And one way we looked at this was just using video tracking. So we positioned small cameras, in one of our chambers above the home cage, and from that we can actually then monitor the activity of animals in the home cage. If you can see on there, um, as the animal runs around the cage, the software is able to actually detect the centre of the animal and the blue surrounding the animal, and actually track it running around in this home cage. And we then define sleep as not when the animal stops moving, but when it's in mobile for an extended period of time, and this was over 40 seconds. And effectively, mice in the home cage will not normally stop and be immobile for 40 seconds or more unless they're going to sleep. Um, and we did this in a group of animals which we were telemetry, telemeter implanted so we could actually measure EEG and validate how effective this is. And this just shows a summary of the two different data sets across 24 hours. And effectively, our co correlation between the two is 0.95. So actually, we get a very good correlation from this across multiple different animals that we can actually reliably assess sleep across um, and the big advantage of this is non-invasive. You simply place an animal in a cage under a camera. And, and what we then went on, went on to do was actually in collaborate in collaboration with Pat Nolan at MRT Harwell. And the MRT Harwell, they were running these large mutagenesis screens in the same way that were originally done by people like Seymour Benson with flies. You create random mutants, then you actually screen for interesting phenotypes. When you find an interesting phenotype, in this case, changes in sleep, what you then do is map the mutation to the gene, which is actually giving rise to that altered behavior. And so we set up, so Pat has these changes, similar changes to us in Harwell. He set up cameras above all of them and actually screened for sleep mutants in the ENU mutagenesis pipeline. And um, within about sort of six or seven pedigrees, we found an animal which actually had really abnormal sleep. And so this is the founder animals, and this is the dark phase when the animals are normally awake. But these animals are actually just, they never sleep at all, the founder animals. They're just you know, constantly active throughout the time. Um, another interesting thing was they expose animals to light, and these animals go to sleep, but the mutants stay to sleep for about over two hours afterwards. So they go to sleep fine, but then they just can't wake up again. Um, and it was only until um, probably only last summer we actually have a, basic, a rough idea of why that happened. 
then Pat's lab went on that in maps to mutation, and this is actually a mutation in planactobrevin, or BAM2, which is part of the snare complex involved in neurotransmitter um, exocytosis. And so in collaboration with Vlad Biosofsky, we had a, um, a detailed student, Matilda Tiomi, who actually then went on to do detailed electrophysiology in these animals to actually study this in more detail. And she actually went on to show that these animals actually show that they reduced sleep during the night. Um, but actually, quite pleasingly, there's a huge reduction in REM sleep. And of course, one of the arguments that people threw at us when we first started saying about screening non-invasively without EEG was, oh, well, you'll miss all of the REM sleep mutants that could be really interesting. And the first mutant found actually has altered REM sleep. Um, uh, Matilda also went on to look at the things like the power density. They have a, you know, a, a really abnormally reduced power density in these mutants. But one of the most interesting things is they actually have this reduction in short duration bouts. So it seems that actually they can go to sleep, but when they do go to sleep, they sleep for long periods. But they seem to really struggle to actually switch in, into sleep. Um, and actually looking at neural, um, spontaneous neural activity um, recordings as well, these, an these animals show uh, the cortical neurons just go silent for long periods. Um, and it just seems that there's this reduced spontaneous activity that's, norm uh, that's normally very characteristic of cortical neurons. Um, and in collaboration with um, a colleague at UCL, they looked at um, neurotransmitter release in tissue from these animals and actually showed that if you provide a train of action potentials to the, um, to the, uh, to the uh, cortex in these animals, they can release neurotransmitter perfectly normally, but to small, you know, single action potential stimuli, they fail to, uh, to release neurotransmitter. So it seems that these actually have this, there's a, a, this deficit in their ability to show um, neurotransmitter release in terms of very brief, um, sort of probably spontaneous stimuli. And it seems that therefore these animals actually have a defect rather than in the sleep per se, it's a defect in switching between vigilance states. So they can go to sleep if you give them a big enough stimulus, like with the, ex the data I showed at the beginning with the light pole, they can go to sleep, but they can't spontaneously then switch back out of that state, or they struggle to actually switch between the states. Um, they also show some other interesting behaviors. So in terms of the sleep location, these are three wild type animals which make nice little nests in their home cage and sleep in a corner. These mice aren't dead, they just go to sleep on the side in the middle of the cage, which causes the technicians and the animals that are looking some concern. You can map that with the heat map of these animals that sleep all over the place. Um, in addition, they show some other odd co um, cognitive deficits. The learning and memory is actually perfectly normal, but we also we did, did some studies using marble burying, which is a test of innate behavior, and it's typically a, a hoarding behavior that might normally sh show. You put a series of marbles across the sawdust in the home cage, most normal animals will actually bury that uh, bury those marbles, uh, whereas these, mu these mutant animals completely ignore them. And this is actually uh, a behavior which is uh, has been shown to change in um, neurodegenerative disease. So, um, so in many ways, these, actual, these animals, the learning and memory is fine, but they do seem to have attentional deficits. Uh, they're also slightly hyperactive and uh, lower body weight. So this is a part of a big study that we're all putting together at the moment. Um, and Um, and then moving on from that a bit, um, Lawrence Brown, who's a postdoc in my lab, also furthered the sort of the sleep phenotyping with a system that we use the tortured acronym of COMPASS for. Um, but effectively, it's a simple passive infrared sensor that you place on the home cage and allow you to actually monitor um, activity. Um, and it's very cheap, easy to implement. Um, and this was, again, validated against EEG. This is four separate animals validated against passive infrared in blue and red with EEG score of sleep. And again, we get this really high correlation with sleep behavior. Um, and actually, the nice thing about this is you get the data instantly. There's no sort of processing. So you actually can tell what your mice are doing at any one moment, whether they're awake or asleep. So this shows blue at the top is the activity, black is sleep periods. And this is over a day, we can look over a week. And Lawrence even looked over a whole month of sleep in these animals. So for doing longitudinal studies of, say, disease progression, this is also kind of quite useful. Um, and an advantage of that is, again, with Pat, Pat's lab, um, they're, they're part of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, which are trying to generate knockout mice um, to every gene in the mouse genome. And so they've been able to actually get key the you know, mice, the you know, genes that they're interested in, knockouts into Harwell, and they've been screening that now with this PIR system that we developed. And so this is eight different genes that they've screened animals and have found in or sleep phenotypes in. 
some of these that were initially chosen related to disease, um, yeah, associations with disease. Um, and there are three of them here which are uh, associated uh, linked to neuropsychiatric disorders. We can also have specifically sleep phenotypes, but not circadian phenotypes. And so this is open again, part of the screen is now also uh, in preparation. So it also gives us new models for them to study sleep, and by being able to screen large numbers of animals in a non-invasive way, we can actually start also making a bit of a better understanding of the genetics of sleep. So moving on then to then sleep and arousal, as I mentioned already, light and nocturnal light exposure results in rapid sleep induction in mice, and this is intensely dependent on the brighter you make the light, the more they sleep. Um, and previous studies have shown, suggested that mutation, that the sleep induction response is impaired in mice that lack the photopigment melanopsin. Um, and this will sort of summarize the key points there. So if that is the key point, the, the, the melanopsin is involved in this acute regulation of sleep, we would also predict that because it's sensitive to blue light, that actually that blue light should be most effective at inducing sleep in mice. So we tried doing that. This was some work done by Viola Flores and postdoc in my lab a few years ago. Um, and she actually showed that effectively blue light impaired sleep induction in mice. So it's exactly the opposite of what we predicted. Um, and it's just that these later sleep phases, they take longer to go to sleep in response to light. If you look at the melanopsin knockout mice, they actually go to sleep more quickly. So we can actually get the opposite phenotype of the published data if we use different wavelengths of light. Um, so how on earth do we explain that? Well, what Violetta went on to also look at is the regulation of adrenal corticosteroid in mice. Previous studies have actually shown that light can also induce cort in mice, shown here in red. Um, and this actually um, is not via the classic ACA pathway, via the pituitary ACTH release, because ACTH, shown here in this scary pink, is actually not regulated at all. Um, and so it's thought instead that it's actually via the autonomic nervous system, via the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and this is actually the same pathway that regulates pineal melatonin, which in some sense is not a surprise. And so when she went to look at this in mice in response to the court levels in response to mice, she actually showed that blue light actually is inducing a lot more court in these animals. If you look at melanopsin, they show an attenuated court response. Um, she won then went on to actually say, well, okay, if this is regulated by court, if we block the action of glucocorticoid uh, receptors using a drug called Nifepristo to block the <coughs> glucocorticoid antagonist, then effectively we can show that compared to the vehicles, animals go to sleep more quickly. So effectively, this, court, this release of court in response to light is actually blocking the sleep uh, response. So this has then led us to start really sort of um, reappraising how um, the role of melanopsin in regulating sleep. So sleep in, first of all, sleep induction response light is a lot more complicated than a lot of the earlier studies suggested. So light can also induce cort, which elevates arousal and prevents sleep. Subsequent studies from Rob Lucas's lab in Manchester, where they used chemogenetic activation of the melanopsin cells, came out around the same time. And actually that showed that they produced arousal and anxiety and not sleep. So actually the recent age is consistent that actually activation, selective genetic activation of these cells is producing arousal and not sleep. Um, the argument for, for you know, why people started looking at the regulation of sleep was that the melanopsin cells were shown at an early point to project to the ventral lateral preoptic area in the hypothalamus, which has been regarded as a primary sleep promoting nuclei. But actually, when we look at this in detail, you may not be able to see it in this slide, but the projection to the velcro from the melanopsin cells when we looked at this is tiny, is a handful of fibers. So it certainly compared to the FDN and visual thalamus and liver pretextual nuclei. There's very little actual projection. Um, and one of the things that was largely not taken into account in the early studies is that the, the, the sleep induction response to light depends enormously on the preceding sleep history. An animal is actually sleep already and you expose it to light, it wakes up. So you can get exactly the opposite response. Um, and one of the other key things that came out of the data, and actually I know there's some unpublished data on this now that's been shared at different conferences, is that actually that um, melanopsin knockout mice for some reason, and we're not quite sure of the details, these mice actually seem to need less sleep. So their basic homeostatic sleep drive is reduced. So they need about an hour's sleep less a day. So the fact that they go to sleep in response to light more slowly is the fact that they're probably just less tired. And so the, it just, it's just a nice example of where the first interpretation of the data in terms of a complex response by sleep induction um, is probably turned out to be incorrect and probably arises from the, the data, the findings may be correct, but the interpretation could be completely um, actually the opposite. 
So impaired sleep, um, impaired and light induced sleep may reflect actually a lower need for sleep in the absence of melanoma. So, <coughs> so finishing off then, just to, to touch on some work we've been doing with learning and memory, and this is a collaboration with David Bannerman and, and psychology. Um, and effectively, there's evidence for the direct effect on learning and memory really came from fMRI studies um, in humans, whereby light altered by people looked at the effects of light um, on human subjects, and you get activation of the hypothalamus, so it didn't have the resolution to say whether it was the SVM, um, and there was some activation of the thalamus as well, subsequent activation of areas that were thought to be around the cerebia, and then you know, six, 15 to sort of 20 minutes later, you get this widespread cortical activation. Um, but of course, working on humans, you can't really look at the mechanism, so it was really unclear whether melanopsin was involved in these responses. So we had a postdoc, Eric Tam, working with David Bannerman a few years ago, and actually went on to just look at a simple test of learning and memory in mice, and this is using novel object recognition. Um, and it, the advantage of this is it's a simple and flexible test of learning and memory that's used in mice. And effectively, for those of you not familiar, you place animals in a test arena, <coughs> you a perfect box, Two, copy, you know, two copies of the same object, um, so take the animal out, there's a delay, and you put it back in and you change one of the objects for a novel object. And the animal well, is expected to actually have habituated to the old object and will spend more time exploring the novel, interesting object. Um, and so, yeah, um, and you can simply look at that as a ratio. Um, but what a lot of people aren't familiar with is that this test in mice is also very sensitive to <coughs> context. So if you change the test arena, in any way between the sample and the test phase, it impairs the animal's performance. And so what Eric did, which was quite clever, was actually change the light intensity between the sample and the test phase. So effectively, they, you know, in between the sample and the test phase, the, the light was bright, in fact, these are all different combinations. But effectively, uh, and then to see whether the animal can recognize whether or not, so to, whether it responds to the changing environment, or whether it continues to <coughs> well and recognize the novel object. And so he looked at mice with rods, cones, and melanopsin. Well, so whilst had rodless coneless mice with no rods or cones, but still had melanopsin, and melanopsin knockouts, which still have rods and cones, so we have all the different combinations. Um, and we predicted that the melanopsin knockouts wouldn't be able to detect this change in the light environment, but the rodless coneless and wild type would. And so he went on to look at this and say, wild type don't live in sample. Um, so we had just no change, and then change the light intensity. And actually, when you change the light, you change the context, the wild type mice perform badly. Um, and exactly as we predicted, the melanopsin knockouts, actually, they continue to perform well. You ignore the fact that the light environment is different. Um, but what surprised us was if you look at those mice with no rods or cones, they do exactly the same. So they, again, they cannot detect, even though these are visual photoreceptors, they cannot detect the fact that the light environment has changed. And so it seems that we need rods, cones, and melanopsin for the effects of light on performance. And so what we're, saying, we're not sure at the moment is whether this is actually an integration of the level of the retina, or alternatively an integration of the level of different um, um, you know, uh, retinal recipient targets in the brain. Um, and so one of the other things actually relating back to this fMRI data we got kind of interested in is can we actually also do anything similar in mice to actually look at these you know, role of specific photoreceptors? So how can we do the activation of these different retinal recipient regions and one way we've just, uh, we've got some unpublished data on that we started looking into this was some work that uh, Lawrence did last year was whole brain FOSS mapping. And so this was actually using an optical clearing technique where we can clear the brain, um, look, at a, um, look, at the act, look at the expression of neuronal markers. In this case, we're using um, FOSS, uh, which is a, measure, uh, it's a marker of um, uh, previous neuronal activity. And we can then do light sheet microscopy, collect all the tissue stacks and basically create a 3D brain reconstruction to see how the brain is activated in response to light. And so we actually found a nice company that would do this for us, rather than reinventing the wheel, um, and did optical clearing and FOSS mapping in mice with no rods or cones that we exposed to light. And we get nice images back where we get activation of the SVN in response to light, we get activation of other brain regions like IGA, the IGL and the amygdala, which the melanopsin cells are known to project to, um, but what was also potentially quite interesting is that we also get activation of the visual cortex. Uh, and these are in mice which are completely blind. So it seems that some information from this non-image forming, non-visual system may even be reaching the visual cortex. Um, and the nice thing with all of this is we're still plowing through data, but we get some patient data, different brain regions that we can then actually look at different, that they can uh, morphologically map 
um, in these um, samples, so we can actually look at this um, and see how different brain regions are activated. So, uh, so this has been a bit of a sort of a, a trial experiment at the moment. Um, and I just finally want to end on um, the thing that probably you, you will be sick of seeing in the media, which I think we have um, people in our field to blame for, which is about evening blue light and light, uh, blue light from tablets, smartphones and tablets. Um, and it's kind of interesting in the fact that whilst it's now widely believed to disrupt circadian rhythms and impair sleep, and you know, the man in the street knows about this, um, it's amazing how quickly this has gone from a quite obscure neuroscientific finding to just about everyone in the population knowing about it, and virtually everyone having a phone in their pocket which probably has a, light, a night mode which reduces the blue light emission. Um, and so actually, what is the evidence for it? Um, and most people, and this is quite entertaining when you do anything with public engagement, where you actually, you say, oh, this is actually what I work on. You, you, you publish things, for example, I mean, had an article in The Guardian about it, and then you read the comment section, comment section underneath, where loads of people are telling you that you're wrong and you don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> so, uh, so what was the actual evidence? Well, this actually came from studies originally done um, Christian Kocker's lab in Basel, showing that Increasing light intensity of white light shows an increase in subjective alertness, and this is measured, measured using the Karolinska sleepiness scale. So as you increase light intensity, you get increased subjective alertness. Um, and then subsequent studies from both Christian's lab and from Steve Lockley's lab in Harvard showed that actually that in, if you take equal intensity uh, blue versus green light, and in this case, this is blue, 480, because it's tuned to the melanopsin system, and green, which is 555 nanometers, which is tuned to the maximum sensitivity of our visual, um, where it's basically about red and green tones, that actually the blue light is more effective at suppressing melatonin and um, you know, um, reducing our subjective sleepiness. Subsequent studies also show with um, the segments of vigilance test that reaction time is also decreased with blue light relative to green light. And of course, all of this is then assumed that it must be mediated by melanopsin. So we got interested a while ago in actually saying, well, is there any way we can actually kind of <coughs> test any of these effects using mouse models? So our modern lighting environment primarily differs from natural light in two ways. This is data from Ken Wright's lab where he took a group of people camping, so they were exposed for a week beforehand to a normal artificial light exposure like we are probably all exposed to, and they you have a nice high, you know, to have a light exposure during the, during the day in gray here, which is lower than it is under natural light. But then they also have this big shoulder here where they're exposed to light for about four hours on the night. Um, and it's a lot dimmer, but it's actually, um, they're still exposed to this light in the evening. And this is the, our artificial light environment. And what he then subsequently shows, this is where the key differences are, what he subsequently shown under electric lighting is that actually our onset of melatonin midpoint and offset and our mean sleep episodes are all shifted as a result of this artificial light exposure. And if you take people camping and don't allow them any exposure to smartphones, any artificial light sources, they were allowed campfires, I think that was about it. Um, and uh, when, then actually the melatonin onset is perfectly tuned to sunset, the offset is perfectly tuned to sun, sunrise, and actually people sleep at acceptable times when their body thinks it's night time. Um, so again, what we were kind of interested in is that, well, is this the effects of these, are these effects of light of our modern light environment mediated by melanopsin? And so one thing, way that we could look at this in mice is we can actually expose mice to light during the day and then we just give them exposure to a dim light on an evening. So this is a log unit less light just for four hours on an evening. And the end result of this, as you see, is with dim light here, the mice then shift their activity. And you can see these animals, this is home cage activity. Even when the light, full light comes on the next day, these animals are still running around in their cage. Um, they're not just going to sleep. Um, and so, of course, what we could then do is look at melanopsin, not about mice. And, um, so is this mediated by melanopsin? Well, no. Melanopsin, not about mice, show exactly the same response. So, you know, this idea of tuning out blue light on an evening, because it's proven by, you know, the melanopsin system is keeping us awake, of course, is not that simple. Um, we weren't particularly surprised by that, but we can easily explain it by, of course, the fact that, um, the, you know, that opt well, so sorry, optimizing light on melanopsin alone is no simple. We can explain it by the fact, of course, that these melanopsin cells receive inputs from the bottom cell. So in the intact retina, what we're actually exposed to, what we're actually sensitive to, is a combination of VODs, green, red, blue cones, and melanopsin. And so actually just tuning things to melanopsin alone, of 
course, will not have any real you know, beneficial effects on um, our circadian uh, responses to light. And actually, the role of Rolf's cones and melanopsin depends upon the biological response you're looking at, the light intensity, the duration of light, the time of day, adaptation of these different systems, even things like flicker, and then there are even subtypes of these melanopsin systems. And so the lighting industry is getting very interested in being able to actually you know, optimize light based on this non-visual system, but they are totally uninterested in the biology mediating it. And, um, and they're often designing products which are never going to work because they're based upon really simple assumptions about the lighting system. And we do try to tell them that, but they don't usually want to, to listen. So. so a single sensitivity function you really can't capture this complexity. So, so on that, I'm just going to summarize basically that light regulates a wide aspects of our physiology and behavior. And, our, you know, so, and we've done work related to this endogenous break within our um, circadian system that stops our clock shifting. Um, and we've also been looking at non-invasive sleep screens for like phylogenetics. So start with an interesting phenotype and then figure out what the gene is to try and get a better understanding of the genetics of sleep. We've also been looking at sort of sleep and arousal, and it is a lot more complicated than some of our earlier studies suggested. Um, effects of light on recognition memory performance, and also effects on things like the effects of light on delaying the, and trying to re recreate the human life experience using an animal model. So with that, I just want to really thank all the people, people in my lab, past and present, um, collaborations with Vlad, David Bauman, RC, Paul Russell, who I realized recently I've known for over 20 years, which is terrifying, and great collaborations with Pat Noah as well. And all. Thanks for coming. So thank you. Because, <laughs> of course, this is regulated probably cyclically and regulated physiology in terms of tissue throughout the body. But even so, if you could do it specifically? If you could target it specifically, you want to? I mean, it yeah. depends on whether actually you could target it specifically to the SCF, because otherwise you're going to be potentially shifting the clocks. So, and uh, people, um, there's, there's been good evidence that actually that the um, clocks in different tissues throughout the body are also sensitive to different times of use. And so, for example, the clock in the liver is very sensitive to uh, feeding. So if you have an animal where you, the SCA clock has been lesioned, then the liver, if you monitor the liver clock, things like um, uh, Uli Schibler did a few years ago, you can show that when the animal eats, the liver clock jumps all over the place. So it's probably a case of you don't want clocks to just uh, respond to any local stimuli as well. So it's trying to constrain physiology, stop it jumping. Of course, jet lag has never been a problem. There's never been any selective pressure exerted on jet lag. We did the calculation. I think it's about seven, <coughs> six or seven hundred miles an hour. You have to be able to travel before jet lag becomes a problem. <laughs> They, the novel object recognition has to perform well, and that's the nice thing with the way that Eric did it, is they perform above chance. So why do we begin? see the novel object? They, the, the novel object recognition task doesn't rely just on vision. They use a whole range. They typically, the animals climb over the object, and so they use a, Eric has developed a version which is entirely visual, 
Um, and the, so the spatial version of it, when you move the object, you require rods and cones for. There is an argument that potentially in the rodless, coneless animals that they could be using different ways to solve the problem. Um, yeah, that's yeah. what my and it's um, yeah, it's difficult to sort of yeah to really assess that. But I think one of the things is that animals are often a lot more a lot cleverer than you assume that they yeah, um, yeah they, they have, will adapt adopt different strategies to solving these sorts of things. Well, I just think they would move. <laughs> right, so if you can't see, they move around, around just as move, much. But so. they, they, they maintain their movement. Isn't that the point that they? Yeah. What were you measuring? We're measuring the time interacting with the object. So the amount of time they interact with the object is the same, and the amount of movement of the animals is the same. Uh, but I thought it, the point was that it didn't drop. They don't. Yeah. So they spend the same amount of time, whether or not the light levels change. And I, and I think that's because the light levels are. If the light levels aren't having an effect, then they're going to do that. If they can't. They can't Effectively, they can't detect. Yeah, they can't detect the fact that the light is changing. Why is that not what you would predict? Because we, we, we initially were thinking that actually that the photoreceptor mediating the effects of the light level is more like it would be melanoxin. But effectively that's monitoring environmental dryness rather than just the, you know, the, the rod cone system by itself. Typically what we found in virtually all the other non-visual responses is you knock out the, you know, the rods and cones and the melanoxin system will compensate or you knock out cones the the melanopsin system and the rods and cones will compensate. So mice without melanopsin can still entrain through a light dark cycle. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, is there a difference in the activity of rod and cones and RGB when your light when your eyes are open versus closed? Um, they will all, I mean, effectively that will relate to yeah, yeah, the, the light adaptation that you'll shift that both your vessel photoreceptors show. So um, of course photoreceptors are wired back to them in many ways, but the rods and cones are typically depolarized with hyperpolarizing response to light, whereas the ganglion cell are depolarized in response to light. But in, in both cases, if you reduce the light intensity, you will reduce um, yeah, activation of the photoreceptor. But then there's a whole series of adaptation mechanisms that allow photoreceptors to work across basically, well, the less well, the less <coughs> protect light from basically, you know, almost sort of like starlight, very dim light, all the way up to bright sunlight. It works over about a nine month unit range. <coughs> Um, yeah, and people have actually, um, Jamie Dykes' group in Stanford has actually shown that you can phase shift people by putting like a mask over them and giving them actually a light source through the eyelid. So you can shift the circadian clock that way. Okay, last question. Um, good. Quick wondering, um, you mentioned this international power scheme of having consortium. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you have rough numbers how many single gene knockouts have created so far? phenotypes at all. <laughs> they keep regular updates on that. I don't know how far they've got through it at the moment. How often do they discover in our sleep phenotypes? Sleep phenotypes, the problem is that there's about 15 or 16 centres, um, and um, I think one there's one other centre other than Parwell that's doing a sleep phenotyping based on one of the piezoelectric film um, systems for detecting sleep. So only two centres across the globe out of the ISDC are actually measuring sleep. So the rest of them have not looked at it. So that's why one of the things we're trying to do is actually any genes that we think of may be interesting from a sleep perspective to get them at heart at Harwell so we can actually know whether or not they affect sleep. So, so why do you work on sleepy six and not the sleepy one and three, four, five? Um, they would usually they were shown to either be um, not not inherited. They usually had a mutation in the founder and it's typically not inherited or um, or the phenotype um, yeah, it wasn't strongly inherited. Thanks so much. That was a wonderful story that is a great clarity and kept everybody awake. <laughs>